Hello and welcome to this video where I'm going to explain four-way mixing in the context of nonlinear optics. To understand four-way mixing, I think it's helpful to first consider the linear case where a laser is being modulated with an external phase modulator that you can buy off the shelf. In this case, the laser signal coming out of the laser enters the phase modulator, which is being driven with a sinusoidally changing voltage. That causes the refractive index inside the phase modulator to change sinusoidally as well, which in turn causes the phase of the light to change sinusoidally. And when that happens, we introduce new frequency components because the phase is being altered in the time domain. Something similar happens in the case of four-way mixing, but in this case, it's not an external voltage that's causing the change in the refractive index, but rather the interference of two lasers. So if we launch these two lasers into the medium, they will interfere in the time domain and cause a temporal variation in the average optical power. If there is, for example, a chi 3 nonlinearity in the medium here, it means that the change in power over time is going to alter the refractive index over time, which in turn is going to alter the phase of the light propagating within over time. And just as before, this is going to lead to new frequency components being generated, and these are what we refer to as the forward mixing products. So before we continue, a little bit of terminology clarity here. So if we insert two frequency components into this expression for the cube of the E field, and again, we'd find the frequency components in the following way, we can see that we get certain terms that oscillate at three times the input frequency. That's what we refer to as third harmonic generation. We also get some terms that oscillate at one of the other frequencies, but with strengths that depend on the power of those frequencies like so. And if it's the power of one field affecting another field, then we refer to that as cross-phase modulation, where the former was self-phase modulation. And essentially, any other term will just be labeled as forward mixing. And in this case, we can see that because we only have two frequencies present inside of this expansion, we always get something called degenerate forward mixing. And we use that word because we can see that every single term contains one of these frequencies twice. For example, this one contains A twice, this one contains B twice. That's why we label it as degenerate. If we had included a third frequency in this expansion, we'd also be able to get terms that look similar to this, where we have three fields arising with none of them being present twice. That's referred to as non-degenerate four-way mixing. Now it's important to understand that because the uh, phase matching between three times the frequency and the input frequency is usually very bad, we can typically ignore any term that oscillates at a very high frequency. And again, this just comes from the fact that the refractive index at some frequency and the refractive index at three times that frequency are very unlikely to be identical, which prevents coherent transfer of power from these ones into these ones. So basically we just ignore all of these up here. Now, another piece of uh, terminology we have to understand is why we even label this as four wave mixing. Why not some other number like five or six? Essentially, the reason is that if we start with this equation here that I've called the master equation in previous videos, we can um, apply some mathematical tricks to it and basically figure out that the evolution of a certain field over here depends on a number of fields on the right-hand side. So in this differential equation, again, we have one field here and three fields over here because we have a chi-3 nonlinearity. If we had, let's say, a chi-4 nonlinearity, we'd simply have four fields on the right-hand side. And in general, we can see that if we have a chi-n nonlinearity, we're still going to have one field on the left-hand side and n fields on the right-hand side leading to n plus one wave mixing. So again, in the case of chi-3, we get four wave mixing. And again, to be clear, um, inserting more frequencies into the expansion for the cube of the E field uh, doesn't change the fact that we're still doing four wave mixing if we just have a chi-3 nonlinearity. Introducing more fields in some sense just makes the approximation more accurate, but any single term that arises out of this still only includes uh, four fields as up here. So hope that clear things up. So anyway, let's actually try to model four-way mixing. So in this case, we're going to assume that we have four frequencies being launched into the medium that are uh, significant enough to be included in this expression for the cube of the E field. The labeling here is that D corresponds to the frequency that's down compared to A, while U is the one that's up compared to B. Hope that is clear enough. So anyway, to compute this cube of the E field, we have to compute the cube of this, this whole expression here. And that's a little bit tedious, but we can start by computing this square, which gives us this blue table right here with all of these different entries. And then we can simply multiply this entire table by each of these terms here uh, individually, and then add up all the results. 
So if we do that, here we have the result for A and for A star. It should be popping up right here. It's quite a big table. And as well as B and B star, of course. And um, this would be D and D star, as well as U and U star. Oh, I can see it's cut off a little bit here. Oh, well, you can probably figure out what was supposed to be in this entry. But anyway, the point is that we just have to add up all of these terms in order to get an expression for the cube of the E field. So um, to make that a little bit easier, we can actually cancel out some of the terms in advance. For example, we know from before that all of the terms corresponding to third harmonic generation or its complex conjugates can just be ignored. So that would be terms like a cubed and uh, b squared a, for example. We can just get rid of those. Similarly, we can neglect any term that contains uh, two conjugations because those will just be the complex conjugates of those that only contain a single one, which is the ones we want to model. So we can get rid of all those two. And that leaves us with all of these uh, terms that survive, and I've broken them down here by the ones that involve self and cross phase modulation, those that involve degenerate four way mixing, and those that involve non degenerate four way mixing. If we additionally uh, narrow down our analysis to only frequencies that uh, correspond to omega d, omega a, omega b, or omega u, we can neglect some more terms here. For example, we can see that any term that involves a star du will survive because in total that one's going to oscillate at omega b, whereas the one called uh, ad u star is not going to survive, quote unquote, because it corresponds to a frequency that's uh, sort of 2 delta omega below here. And again, note that we've uh, assumed here that the spacing between these frequencies is identical and just equal to delta omega. So with that, we get slightly fewer terms, and in the end we get this expression here for the field components that oscillate at omega d, a, b, and u respectively. We can simplify this a little bit more if we assume that the power of the A field and the power of the B field are much, much greater than the power of the D and U fields. So essentially we're treating A and B like very intense pumps that are delivering power to these two other ones, but don't really get affected by them. So with that in mind, we can cancel out a lot of the terms, leaving us with only these ones that affect the cube of the E field, and thus the master equation. So to begin, I think we should start by modeling the evolution of the A and B fields, because they're comparatively simple. If we um, only take the terms that os oscillate at omega a or omega b, we're going to get this expression right here. And computing the Fourier transform and extracting, for example, the omega a component gives us this expression here. Now, this can be plugged back in to the master equation, and then we can apply something called the slowly varying envelope approximation to simplify the expression for the second derivative and just turn it into a single derivative right here. The point is that we get a differential equation which can be solved analytically to give us this expression here for the evolution of the electric field component corresponding to omega a. And we see that it's just the initial value right here multiplied by a complex exponential that depends on the absolute square of the uh, component itself as well as the b component. And of course we get something equivalent for the b component as we see right here. Before we proceed, I think we should clean up this expression a little bit and we can do that by introducing a new constant called gamma a, which is given by all of this right here. In this case, A effective is simply the effective area of the field that's propagating. Now in this analysis, we don't really consider the transverse behavior of the field, we just care about how it changes as we move forward. But I guess for the case of like an optical fiber or some kind of waveguide, we can just assume that AF is the effective area of the, of the mode. So with that in mind, we can rewrite the two expressions from before in the following way. And then we can notice that multiplying a squared electric field onto this thing right here actually gives us the power of the field. And that's quite convenient because we've assumed that uh, EA and EB are quite strong. So expressing everything in terms of these powers that are basically constant is quite convenient. Furthermore, we can also rescale the fields outside here so that their absolute square has units of uh, power and of course are equivalent to the actual power of the field. So again, this makes things a bit more neat and tidy. Furthermore, we can assume that all of the gamma values for both uh, A, B, U and D are all identical. Now that's not a strict requirement, it just makes some of the math a little bit more simple. So we're going to make that for now. <clears throat> okay, let's now try to model the evolution of the omega u component. So we see that the evolution is governed by three different terms. There's this term right here that basically corresponds to cross phase modulation of the two pumps. There's this term here that corresponds to degenerate four-way mixing. And then this term here that corresponds to non-degenerate four-way mixing. So first of all, we can rescale all the fields as we did before. And then to make things a bit simpler, we can introduce this new field called BU. That's simply a, I guess we can call it a face rotated version of the initial field AU. 
by an amount that depends on the amount of cross phase modulation. So the point here is that if we take the derivative on both sides and then substitute back into the equation above, we can see that this term right here and this one down here will actually cancel out if we substitute in the definition of AU right here in terms of BU. So this one's going to cancel this one, giving us an evolution equation that only contains two terms instead of three up here. So that's a, bit, a little bit nicer. Now, to continue our model here, we can um, substitute in the expressions for uh, the B and A components that we found just earlier. You can see we got a new term here that depends on the amount of cross phase modulation and the same thing right here. And uh, if we then, um, what do we do here? Let me just double check. Oh yes, we just simplified the expression like so. And uh, then we can divide by this complex exponential to get this expression right here. And finally, we can substitute uh, AD star by simply BD star using the previous definition. And then we get this expression here for the field evolution. Okay, so of course we can do that for both the U component and the D component, giving us these two equations here that you'll notice are coupled because the derivative of BU depends on uh, BD star and the other way around. So now we can make a quick assumption here that the spacing between these frequencies is very small compared to any of the individual frequencies. And the reason why we do this is that under this assumption, we can see that this difference of spatial frequencies up here, as well as the one over here, actually look quite similar to the approximate second derivative of beta with respect to omega. So with that um, in mind, what's the second derivative of beta with respect to omega? Well, that's simply beta 2, which is the group velocity dispersion coefficient. So what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that forward mixing is very strong, close to the zero dispersion frequency. Because remember, in this sort of equation, when we have a complex exponential with a bunch of terms inside, um, essentially the solution is going to be uh, have a large value if the argument up here is very small or close to, close to zero. So in other words, if this one's close to zero, we're... Uh, we have phase matching and then we get coherent buildup of u and d by stealing power from a and b so to speak and as a matter of fact this process is going to be most efficient when beta 2 is negative and not just close to zero but actually negative because in that case we can see that it's possible for the negative value of beta 2 to be cancelled out by the uh, corresponding contribution from the cross phase modulation here so in other words we expect that for a negative beta 2 value there is some kind of power that causes the uh, two effects to uh, balance out both dispersion and nonlinearity, which causes a very strong coherent power transfer from A and B into D and U. So this is also known as modulation stability, at least for the case where um, A and B are very closely spaced, but we're going to get into that in just a moment. Okay, so to continue, let's just quickly undo that assumption from before that the frequencies are closely spaced, and instead assume that the uh, terms up here are very far away from being zero, which means that phase matching, or rather the lack of phase matching, causes this term here to drop out and for us to only look at this one individually. So if we do that, we can see that it just contains a single complex exponential now that depends on set and nothing else does. So solving this is quite easy by introducing a, I guess, a phase matching constant k in this case and simply integrating on both sides. Now this is fairly elementary. We can assume that bu of 0 is just 0 and um, we can then factor out part of the exponential here and notice that the result looks very much like a sine function. So with that, if we compute the absolute square on both sides, we can see that the power of the BU component is going to scale as basically a sine function right here. Note also that it depends on the square of the power PB and uh, only linearly on PA, at least sort of directly if we ignore the behavior of the sine part right here. So if we uh, actually graph this as a function of set we um, can plug in some parameters here for the uh, power and the nonlinearity, and we can notice that we get phase matching, of course, when the value of delta beta cancels out the effect of uh, gamma p right here. So that's the phase match case where the power grows as basically set squared. If the phase matching isn't perfect, we can see that the power also increases as a parabola initially, but at some point it begins to sort of uh, tip over and behave more like a sine function, which peaks right here. And of course, you can see that if we have very bad phase matching, then the peak is lower and the oscillation is more frequent. So for very bad phase matching, we don't really reach a high peak power and it sort of oscillates up and down very quickly anyway. So that's why we can drop out terms that aren't phase matched. Okay, so with degenerate forward mixing out of the way, let's take a look at non-degenerate forward mixing. 
So we're still going to assume that we have a fairly large spacing here, and we're also going to assume that somehow we've managed to choose these frequencies that are present here in such a way that the the generate for mixing terms are not phase matched. So this one and this one will be far away from zero, so we can just drop out those two. That leaves us with two equations that are coupled and also easy to solve analytically. Oh, well, I wouldn't say easy, but at least simpler to solve analytically. Now, what we can do is we can first solve for BD star in the first equation and BU in the second equation. And then we can compute another derivative of both equations. That's quite convenient because now you can see that this one depends on the derivative of pd star, which we know from up here, as well as on pd, which we know from right here. And of course, the equivalent thing happens for the second equation. And this means that we can, of course, decouple them. So doing that, it looks a bit complicated initially, but very quickly we notice that a lot of these terms will actually uh, cancel out and simplify, giving us this expression here for the evolution of uh, bu. Now, if we move all the terms to the left-hand side and then introduce some other parameters just for convenience, we can very easily see that this looks like the equation for damped harmonic oscillation. Or maybe we should call it boosted harmonic oscillation, because in this case, of course, the uh, evolution isn't really dying down, it's actually increasing with distance. Now, this um, type of equation, of course, has been solved many times. It's quite a fundamental system to model this sort of damped harmonic behavior. So I'm just going to link to a note in the description that explains how to do this. But the point is that the BU field will evolve according to these two complex exponentials right here where the s plus and s minus parameters are given in the in the following way here. Okay, so why do we care about this? Well, let's try and simplify the result slightly and see what happens. So we can factor out the oscillation and then see that the strength of the BU field will basically change exponentially as we move forward. You can see this contribution here will basically grow exponentially, and this one will kind of die out fairly quickly because it has a negative here. But the point is we get a sort of an increase that's exponential as we as we move forward. In fact, we can think about this whole square root factor here as a gain parameter. And um, if we assume that the total power is split evenly between the PA and PB components, we can uh, sort of see that this G factor looks a little bit like the equation for a circle. You can see this looks kind of like R squared, and this looks a bit like minus X squared. So a little bit like a circle. And indeed, if we do graph it, we get something that looks quite semicircular, like, like so. And this would be the gain profile for the non-degenerate forward mixing for a case where the A and B frequencies are distinct. What we notice is that um, we can see that if we choose a higher and higher power, then we get more and more gain, but also the gain peak shifts further and further to the left to more and more uh, negative values of the phase matching. And again, remember that we expect the phase matching to be better for a negative value of beta 2. That's kind of what we're seeing here as well. Now, in the special case where omega A and omega B are identical and we carry out the whole analysis just with three frequency components in the beginning, we actually get these sort of nice semicircular uh, graphs that are all matched up at zero right here. And um, essentially, if we, instead of graphing this as a function of the spatial frequency mismatch directly, graph it as a function of uh, delta omega with beta 2 having this value right here, which is typical for a telecom fiber near 1550, we have these interesting sort of side lobes that arise as a function of the difference away from the central frequency. So again, you have to imagine that we launch a single frequency into the medium here, and that causes all the frequencies adjacent to it to experience gain, at least as long as we're in the negative dispersion region. So that's what we know as modulation instability, which I've made some videos about as well. Now, um, as a quick simulation, of course, I also launched in a continuous wave signal right here with um, the parameters I mentioned in the previous slide. And you can see that indeed we get these sort of side lobes that appear at the expected frequency differences. So in other words, as we propagate forward, these frequencies here will sort of begin to steal power from the main one and grow more and more intense as we, as we move forward. Okay, so you might think that I'm finished talking about forward mixing now, but there actually is another approach to modeling it that I think you'll find interesting. And that is the nonlinear Schrodinger equation approach to forward mixing. So I've written the nonlinear Schrodinger equation here in its scalar form, which is probably the simplest one. And um, then I'm going to assume that the field we're launching in is sort of dominated by just two frequency components right here at the input with two different powers that could be could be distinct. Now the power of that field is simply given by the absolute square of it. And we can see that it's uh, characterized by these two sort of power offsets, P, A, and P, B, and then an oscillation that sits on top of it that changes with time in a way that depends on the frequency spacing up here. Next, we're going to assume that 
the dispersion length is very, very large compared to the nonlinear length. Or in other words, we can assume that beta 2 is very small in magnitude. So if we do that, we can see that this term here can be cancelled out, reducing the nonlinear Schrodinger equation to the following form, which can actually be solved quite easily, because this field here doesn't really depend on the set coordinate. So with that in mind, we can notice that the, um, um, the output field basically looks like the input field multiplied by a complex exponential, like so. And if we define this sort of constant part right here, it's just q and move it to the other side, we basically get an equation that says that the field at the output is simply a sinusoidally phase modulated version of the field at the input. So to make some more progress, we can notice that there's something called the jacobi enger expansion, which states that when you have this sort of strange structure here with a cosine function inside of a complex exponential, that can actually be expressed as an infinite sum of individual frequency sidebands that are spaced apart according to these Bessel functions, where the argument is simply the amplitude of the, of the oscillation right over here. So visually, we can say that when you have this sort of um, oscillating wave here with a cosine inside of a complex exponential, then basically we can write that as an infinite sum of frequency sidebands with different strengths and also different relative phases, like so. And um, in fact, if you've done a bit of electrical engineering, this might seem kind of familiar, because if you've worked with, let's say, sort of uh, square waves or sawtooth waves, you know that they can be expressed as sums of uh, sine waves with varying strengths and phases. And I think in the case of the uh, infinite square wave here, it's probably like a sync function that describes the relative power of these different harmonics. And this is just the same thing. It just so happens that when you have a cosine function inside of your complex exponential, you need to use these jacobi Enger expansion and Bessel function in order to model it correctly. So again, might be familiar to a lot of you. So anyway, um, to continue, we're going to normalize the powers here to the value of gamma and L, and then we're going to um, apply this Jacobian expansion, but then multiply it onto the initial field. So if we do that, we have to be a bit careful because one of these terms here will already include a complex oscillation, while the other one won't, at least if we factor out this part here, giving us these two infinite sums with different indices. Um, but we can actually remedy that by simply shifting the summation of the left-hand sum here by plus one, giving us this expression here for the uh, fields that oscillate at this particular frequency. So continuing on, we can see that the um, field at the output is simply given by this sort of um, structure right here, where the individual frequencies have strengths that depend on the coefficient am, where am is given by the special functions multiplied onto the square roots of powers. Now if we actually simulate this sort of situation where we have two lasers being launched in and sidebands being generated, we can see that indeed they evolve according to uh, this equation right here in the way we would expect. Now, um, one thing you might note is that we can actually compute the power of the mth order sideband by just computing the absolute square of AM, giving us this formula right here that involves two different Bessel functions. Then if you make the assumption that the argument of the Bessel functions are fairly small compared to the Bessel function argument, or Bessel function order, I should say, we can notice that the normalized power of the mth order sideband will be given by this expression here, where we can see that it depends on integer exponents of the two input powers over here, as well as on the uh, squared factorial of the sideband number. So this part here kind of guarantees that if you go to higher order sidebands, the power is going to drop quite quickly because we're dividing by the square of the factorial or something. That's a pretty large number to divide by. But something interesting to note is that if you look at component one here, which would correspond to u in our previous analysis, then it depends on the power of b squared, like so. And um, if you look at the second order sideband, that depends on b cubed and so on and so forth. So it's sort of interesting that the higher order sidebands are more sensitive to changes in power than the lower order ones. For example, if we double the power of the b component here, you can see that the m equal to 1 component is going to quadruple its power, while the one at m equal to 2 is going to, I guess, octuple the power. It's going to get 8 times larger anyway. So that's sort of an interesting observation. And um, if we look beyond that sort of narrow approximation range and instead look at a situation where we put in a large argument, that is to say a large amount of power or very long fiber, we can see that we expect the Bessel function to sort of saturate and then begin to oscillate. So if we run the simulation as well, we see that indeed the low order sidebands begin to saturate and oscillate if we put in a lot of power, while the high order ones still exhibit this sort of power scaling behavior we saw before. Okay, but why should we care about this nonlinear Schrodinger equation approach to modeling four-way mixing?
well, the obvious answer is that this is what I wrote my PhD thesis on, so that instantly makes it the most interesting and uh, important piece of research in the last century. But uh, jokes aside, it does have some practical applications apart from just me being excited about it for biased reasons. We saw that the power of the mthorter sideband will scale as integer exponents of the input powers. So this means that if you launch, for example, a pulse into a nonlinear medium along with a, um, I guess a pump laser, you can think about it as, then you can extract a higher order sideband and get a shrunk down version of that pulse because it's been raised to an integer exponent. And um, if, for example, you have some kind of environmental fiber sensor where, let's say, the arrival time of this pulse tells you something about the temperature of a sensor, then having narrow pulses being generated will allow you to um, distinguish smaller changes in temperature, basically increasing the resolution. And in fact, that's what I wrote my first paper on. My second paper actually exploited a different aspect of these um, sidebands, namely that higher order sidebands are more sensitive to changes in input frequency compared to lower order ones. In other words, if you keep one laser fixed here and then sweep the other one, then higher order sidebands are going to experience greater frequency sweeps and ones that are below actually will experience negative frequency sweeps. So me and another student actually used this effect to increase the sensing range of a particular type of fiber sensor. Finally, I guess the uh, main contribution I did in my thesis was an analytical model that allows us to describe how the power of the sidebands depends on relative polarization when expressed on the Poincaré sphere. Because as you might imagine, we get the most sideband generation when the two input lasers are copolarized but we get much lower uh, sideband generation when they're orthogonally polarized. So I basically created a model that correctly explains how the output power depends on the relative input polarization. And I use those both for improving the um, sensitivity of a fiber sensor, but also for creating this interesting system for measuring polarization of two lasers by comparing them directly to each other instead of referencing them to an external uh, device like a, a wave plate or something like that. So I'm um, not sure how useful that part is, but it's kind of novel at least. So um, please feel free to check out the description for way more details about this. I've linked both my own thesis and some theses written by other people in my group. And oh, and I also want to highlight that I'm not the one who invented this approach to modeling four-way mixing. That was done by someone else, but I've linked their original paper in the description too. Okay, so just a quick summary of everything we've discussed in this video. Um, we discussed two different approaches to modeling four-way mixing. There's first of all the master equation approach, and then second of all, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation approach. And I think the advantage of the first one is that um, essentially it gives us an easy way to handle the effect of dispersion, which is almost always present in any uh, waveguard medium that you're interested in. Whereas the advantage of the uh, second one is that you can model the evolution of all sidebands simultaneously, at least as long as you are very close to the zero dispersion frequency. The disadvantage of the um, first approach is that to get better accuracy of the model, you have to introduce more and more frequency components. As, as we saw from the tables I showed you earlier, that very quickly gets very, very complicated. So, um, and besides, if you use some of the typical approximations of some of the pumps being very strong, well, then the result is only valid in when that limit is still satisfied. But this one's basically always, um, the second one's basically always valid in some sense, um, at least as long as you're close to the zero dispersion frequency. Now, um, I guess the, that's also kind of the disadvantage of the second approach, namely that it's only valid when you're close to uh, beta 2 being equal to, to zero. It doesn't really apply outside of that. I guess another really important crucial detail here is that for the first approach, we are approximating the cube of the E field. So we're pretending that the um, field is behaving differently than it actually does, but we're sort of treating the medium as being um, uh, the way it actually, it's, the medium is realistic in the first one, basically. Whereas for the second approach, we're treating the field itself as being ideal, but we're assuming that the waveguard of the fiber has um, is simplified in the case that it's close to the zero dispersion frequency. So which one's more relevant for your use case depends a little bit on what you're trying to model. I'd say that if you um, really want to model the uh, four-way mixing close to the zero dispersion frequency, this is probably the easy approach, but this one's a bit more uh, generally applicable, I would say, because it doesn't really um, ignore the effect of dispersion, which is typically quite significant. So anyway, thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.